uh, I was just thinking how to give my message in such a short time, and I think that actually a lot of things have been already said. So I would want to give a sort of a message out of my heart instead. And I have to say that being Polish, when I came here, I realized that there is a lot of similarities between Georgia and Poland. Uh, we are both, uh, what I would say, mono-religious nations. 90% of Poles are baptized in the Catholic Church, and majority of Georgians are members of the Georgian Orthodox Church. Uh, we have uh, similar problems when it comes to geography. Uh, we say it in Polish that we have a lot of uh, big brothers on both sides. I think you have three sides. Uh, why do we say brothers and not neighbors? Because brothers, I mean, because neighbors you can choose. Brothers you have, and you have to be happy with it. Uh, and we also have a very long uh, Christian history and tradition. This year, Poland is celebrating 1,050th anniversary of baptism of Poland. Georgia is even seven centuries older in this respect. So the rich Christian culture, Georgia is the second oldest nation in the world that is Christian. So we have to admire this and learn from this tradition. And then we have similar experience in recent times. We've been both occupied by the Bolshevik uh, system, the, the communism, where there was a lot of persecution of our faith and the dignity of human person meant nothing, you know, it just had to be obedient to the party. And uh, I, uh, I don't want to describe the life in communist times because uh, I think we, we know how it was. Even the young people can learn from their parents. Uh, but you know, I remember that during the communist times, we had dreams. We had dreams uh, of being free you know, freedom of travel, freedom of speech, the censorship was terrible, uh, freedom of religion. Uh, those were our dreams. And, you know, and, uh, I don't know how it was in Georgia, probably the same, but in Poland, we all tried to listen to Radio Free Europe and things like that. And it, uh, in most of Polish minds, the West was seen as like an ideal haven, a, a place where human dignity is respected, where, where there is full religious freedom, where, where, well, it's just, you know, everything is perfect. And so we, we wanted to be reconnected to that culture. We struggled hard. And in our history, God gave us also a big gift. It is uh, spiritual leaders. You know, without moral authority, a nation is very vulnerable. In our case, it was Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski who led our church through the most difficult times. Then was uh, Cardinal Wojtyla, then John Paul II, you know all that. But uh, I see that there's also a similarity here in Georgia. I see your patriarch in the same way <coughs> His, his role and, and uh, his leadership is very similar to, to the servant of God, uh, Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski. Uh, so we, we see this help and these similarities. And now, when the changes came, when, when we finally fought hard enough to regain uh, independence, what has happened? You know, during the communist time, there was shortage of everything. You remember those days. I remember the help from the West, you know, those containers with food and with uh, all those chocolate bars with uh, very short expiry dates and things like that. Uh, but actually, after this wave of food, the next wave was pornography. And I remember interpreting a, a big expert on social issues coming from Sweden. And this woman just couldn't grasp that there is, in Polish language, no way to translate his, her definition of family. You know, 
I, I was just explaining to her, I was a little naive at the time, but because I was interpreting her also, and I told her, listen, in Polish culture, there is no family until a child shows up. If people get married, we call it a couple, a married couple. But when they have their first child, then they have a real family. And she started to talk about different families, different uh, I couldn't even, I didn't even know how to translate it to Polish because everybody was looking like that. Is this woman crazy or something? And, and look what has happened uh, over those 25 years or so. It's terrifying. And I, the title of my talk was uh, How Did the West fell, Fall Into the Trap of the Death Culture? And I tried to analyze all this, and uh, most of the information in a very scientific way was already given to you. I referred to the talks during the first day about the whole gender ideology. I referred to the talk about the sex revolution and the whole struggle in the West. But, you know, this is a sort of an academic approach. But a regular person living at home, I remember because I lived for a short time in Canada in the 60s. The people in those days still had large families and uh, if somebody was divorced, he looked suspicious, you know, you better not do business with them, it's not trustworthy. Uh, they preferred to employ a family man than a single man because they knew that he can be more reliable, more responsible. Since he's taking care of his own family, it means that he has to be by nature responsible, so he will be a better employee, uh, and things like that. And what has happened? Of course, we, we had that sex revolution. and. Uh, things started to evolve. I remember um, the time when there was a discussion whether uh, birth control should be morally okay or not. And uh, Pope Paul VI, when he wrote his encyclical, Humane Vitae, he was so attacked. And a lot of churches said he was wrong. But you know, it's amazing. One of my Protestant pro-life friends a few years ago told me this was a prophetic document. What he wrote there really happened because he knew that this would destroy the family, destroy the church also. And, but what were the mechanics? Of course, before contraceptives were available, um, people knew where the babies come from. And they knew that they have to be responsible for sexual behavior. This is why they behave more normally, as we would say. But once they had this tool, they knew that it's no problem anymore because nobody will find out that we had sex because there will be no pregnancies. So this changed the morality of people. And uh, as we've heard here today, Especially in English language, there is a lot of uh, linguistic traps. You know, I always tease my American friends about using the term birth control because it's a very stupid term. <coughs> the birth is controlled by the child that's being born. There's no other way to control it. What you can control is the conception of a baby, not his birth or her birth. But it's just the linguistic traps, which are part of the deaf culture. And you see, you know, the watch, the hand is moving very quickly. Uh, I would just show you a symptom. Nowadays, if you speak with young people, or actually not so young also, uh, and you say, you know, you should, for example, be aware of, of your physiology, your fertility. You should uh, study, for example, uh, natural fertility recognition. You, you should learn more about yourself, you know, learn NFP and things like that. And, and the response I, I get very often is, it's none of your business. This is my private, personal matter. 
church should not interfere. It's not their business. You know, with Catholics, it's even worse because they say, that priest has no right to tell me anything. He's not married. <laughs> and, and then they say the sentence, which is the key to the whole mentality. Leave me alone. I know how to protect myself. I know how to protect myself. And then I ask a question. Have you seen somebody protecting himself against winning a million in a lottery? No. You protect yourself against something bad, something evil. And you see, this is the trap. The first trap, which people didn't even notice in the 60s. You know, when they think about it, they know that their offspring, you know, the beautiful babies, all, all the photos and all the family photos, the children are great, they're the future of our nation. They keep on repeating these slogans. But subconsciously, they treat their own offspring as a threat, as an enemy, against which they want to protect themselves. So they invest money in whatever they buy, they swallow it, destroy the health of the woman, and as a result, because it's a technical thing, sooner or later it fails. What then? Well, we've been cheated. It's unfair. I paid the money, and it didn't work. I demand warranty. I demand the problem to be fixed. So they go to abortion. So this mentality of being afraid of your own fertility is called the contraceptive mentality. And this is the first stage of the death culture. Everything else follows afterwards. And, but if you analyze, look, the whole motivation is based on fear. And think, how does fear relate to your own autonomy, to your freedom? If you want to be free, if somebody wants to be free, he should not be afraid. In no other way, if you want to enslave somebody, all you have to do is terrorize him. So by falling into the trap of contraceptive mentality, we are surrendering our autonomy. We are not free anymore. And, and the, 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 the worst thing is that in order to empower women, all you have to do is teach them where the babies come from, but not uh, about different sexual techniques, as sex ed education would like it, but to be responsible for the great gift of God of their fertility. If they learn their own physiology, they will know that they can conceive a child in a very short time in the whole huge cycle. And once they are masters of themselves, and they know exactly what's happening, the fear disappears. It's just like, for example, the eclipse of the sun. During the time when people didn't know where it came from, they were terrified when it was dark all of the sun. But nowadays, people just observe it as a very interesting phenomenon. And, and so, so this is my point. This is why education is so important. But I have bad news for pharmaceutical industries. Once women know that they won't buy your contraceptives, and their health will be much better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Lech and Kowalewski. Now it's time for the floor of Steven Phelan. Steven Phelan, Director of Mission Fellow of Human Life International. Actually, <coughs> actually it's Phelan, as in Phelan to communicate. <laughs> for those of us from the, the U.S. Um, like others here, we're kind of tweaking our presentations, carving them down a little bit as we go along. Um, I also I, I greatly appreciate the previous uh, comments being made here. Um, I do find great value in the history of the cultural Marxism and things led to it, um, but mostly because they are second-rate thinkers. I, I think you're right about that. But we are now ruled by second-rate thinkers and third-rate thinkers. And coming from the U.S., we know very well what it's like to be ruled by third-rate thinkers, because we're now foisting that upon the rest of the world. So that's, that's kind of what my, language, my talk is about, is about the language that the US and its surrogates and the rest of the world are using 
to spread its particular poison <coughs> around the world. Um, this, of course, goes way back, so I'll, I'll be able to skip some of this as I go through, but a great prophet of many of these things was Pope Leo XIII, who in 1891, on this date, in 1891, released Rear and Navarro, a very important document for our time. It was the first of the social encyclicals, and there was a, lots of brilliant stuff in it, but one particularly important message for us today, I think, is that, um, well, I'll just read two. So, the momentous gravity of the state of things fills every mind with painful apprehension. And the danger lies in this, that crafty agitators are intent on making use of these differences of opinion to pervert men's judgments and stir up the people in revolt. So he was talking about socialism very much back in the day, but these crafty agitators have not left us, obviously. Call them third-rate thinkers, call them activists, call them what you will, uh, often Americans. Um, but the, the poison has now spread very far. So as, as we heard a great deal yesterday and still a little bit here today, um, it's very important to pay attention to the particular language they are, they are using. Um, in America, a couple years ago, we had a progressive president who was caught in a very embarrassing situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis a young lady uh, in, in his, his office. And he was, he was dragged out in front of people. It was a very embarrassing uh, situation for the country. But uh, when it came time to defend himself on a key point, he actually said, asked to define what was actually being talked about, he said, well, it depends what your definition of is, is. Now, he's not a philosopher, this guy. Um, very much a, second, a, a very smart person, very crafty agitator. And it, it, it very much does depend how we define these words, whether it is is, whether it is the word progress, the progress of the I'd say the poison of progress that we're bringing to the rest of the world. That we trip people into thinking is sophisticated thinking. You want to be like those Western elites, right? You want to have the right opinions, you want to be able to say them in that, the, the cleverest ways, even if those things are undermining the values that, you, that really made your own countries great. So what I wanted to talk to you about today was, was making sure that you pay attention to this language when it comes from these very second-rate thinkers. So. Um, the words, and the words they use are very valuable words, you know, tolerance, equality, health, and now love is being particularly abused as a way to, you know, in the, in the fight to redefine marriage. Who would stop love, right? How can you stop love? How can you stop two men from their loving relationship that men and women have been enjoying for, for all of history? So. So I, I just want people to understand these words as they come down the pipe. Um, and again, another very non-third-rate thinker was George Orwell, who told us that, but if thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. So um, as a director of communications, I'm you know, what we call a language guy in America. And so we, we also work with language, but we're trying to reinstall truth into what's, what's already being uh, put out there, to recall the natural goods of marriage and family and the great gifts that we give to each other in marriage. And I, I think these are the great things we need to recover. And so when, when these ideas come from America, you can see them coming. I want you to, to really think carefully about how to build up communities that will fight against this. Communities that will understand what's going on. Communities that have reached out to politicians, not just, not just to threaten your politicians, which is also very useful sometimes. Because the government should be afraid of the people, not the other <coughs> government. But because it's better to have relationships with them. It's better to be their friends and to work through those channels so that you can really hold them accountable as a friend holds another friend accountable. Um, and we see this more every day. I work, again, for Human Life International. We're a pro-life and pro-family missionary apostle with friends throughout 80 countries of the world, and even more sometimes, depending on where we're working. And every day, like, like many of you, we're, we're confronting these distortions of language. Things like comprehensive sexual education, sexual health and reproductive rights. Things that like to the, to the neophyte, to the person who's just coming to the fight, like who can be against this? But at the UN and other places where these words are particularly used, they're really being used to put a tremendous amount of pressure on people who find the, the elite opinions, the ones that they too want to hold. So remember this, the word elite is also a very abused word these days. So, um, but these words, again, just to give you a, a recent case, um, 
there, there was a case recently in Kenya in 2010 where there was a constitutional referendum where reproductive health was on the docket. It was, it was supposedly about uh, eliminating corruption, which I think we've also heard great recently is the justification for a referenda and politicians in the Philippines, everybody wants to eliminate corruption. But pay attention. Pay attention to the language that slips in, especially reproductive health language and diversity, equality, tolerance language like that. What happened in Kenya was, for some reason, the American vice president went to Kenya to tell people to vote a particular way on this bill. Why would they do that? Actually, a whole, whole string of congressmen going, why so many people, why, why are so many Americans going to Kenya to tell Kenyans how to vote on their own law? Uh, Biden even said, Joseph Biden, our, our vice president, even told people that if they did the right thing, if they passed this resolution, that the spigots of money would open up for the country. Of course, with all this pressure, the people did the right thing, and as promised, the money came right behind it. So if you know the government, if you know the people in the government, you can get a piece of that. The people who most need the money will not get a piece of that. It's because once aid comes, this perpetual aid flow from the, the wealthy countries, we're, we're actually bankrupt, by the way. I don't know if you've heard that, but we're out of money in the United States. We're, we're just borrowing it from other people and pretending we haven't. So, But you bring all this money and you put tremendous pressure on the country. So when these things happen, it's very important to pay attention to, to the amount of energy that the Western powers are putting.